Now, thanks for joining Hashtag Fearless Conversations this morning. I'm Anna Blath. I'm one of the senior journalists with the Advertiser in the arts and entertainment sector. And I'm joined by Patrick McDonald. He is our arts editor. And we'll be facilitating today's discussion and encouraging our guests to be brave. Now, before I hand over to Patrick to introduce today's panellists, I'd like to acknowledge that we are meeting on the traditional country of the Ghana people of the Adelaide Plains and pay respect to elders past and present. We recognise and respect their cultural heritage, beliefs and relationship with the land. We acknowledge that they are continuing of, of, beg your pardon, of continuing importance to the Ghana's people living today. And we also extend that respect to other Aboriginal language groups and other First Nations. Patrick, I'll hand over to you. Thanks, Anna. Uh, if I could introduce our panellists for today now. First of all, uh, Kate Crozer, the Chief Executive of the South Australian Film Corporation. Uh, next to her, Gary Stewart, uh, Artistic Director of Australian Dance Theatre for the past 22 years, and now Professor of Assemblage, uh, Flinders University's new Centre for Creative Arts. Then we have uh, Heather Kroll, Artistic Director and Chief Executive of the Adelaide Fringe. And finally, Douglas Gautier, Chief Executive and Executive Director of the Adelaide Festival Centre. Um, just to get the conversation started, the arts and live entertainment industry was one of the first and hardest hit by COVID restrictions and one of the last to fully open up again. There's been little government support at the grassroots level for individual artists and the hospitality industry is also at risk, which is an area that not only provides stages and gigs for many of those performers, but also often acts as a secondary source of employment for artists as bar work and uh, restaurant work. How does the arts industry rebuild now that those walls are finally coming down? Douglas, perhaps you'd like to? Well, it's been tough, you're right, Patrick, uh, for sure, and particularly on artists. I think we've been very lucky in this state generally uh, because of uh, uh, the scarcity of, of uh, COVID infection. And I do think that government has tried to help with independent artists and uh, in any way uh, that it possibly can. But nonetheless, it's been a, a difficult time. Uh, but I do feel that the sector has come together very strongly in terms of you know, getting festivals on, getting uh, getting work on where we can. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we, we just run the Asia Festival. We had 180,000 people come out for it. So that shows you the kind of appetite, I think, for the community, you know, for work uh, and for artist involvement. And I do think there is a, a real... Uh, opportunity and responsibility on the art sector to help with COVID rebuild, particularly, for instance, in bringing people back into the city. Right. Heather, the Fringe will be one of the first big events to roll out once borders uh, reopen and uh, uh, restrictions ease. Mm. How can we gear up and, and get uh, the maximum benefit for artists now uh, that uh, the restrictions are easing. Yeah, I mean, as as Douglas said, I mean, I think that South Australia um, has um, been really lucky in that the scarcity of COVID has allowed way more events and activities to happen here than probably you know hardly anywhere else in the world. Um, the additions of um, Fringe, Adelaide Festival, Ausasia, so many events have continued um, in little windows of uh, where restrictions visa, even in 21, we still had um, uh, 650,000 tickets sold in a Fringe with a thousand shows almost. So that is direct um, earnings going into artists and arts workers pockets because with the fringe it's the box office that pays people. Um, we also raised uh, significant funds from the government that we gave out in grants direct. We didn't keep any of it in fringe headquarters at all. Mm -hmm. we, we raised money which we then pushed straight out to artists and venues as interventions to help them feel confident to take that risk of putting on a season and believing that they could sell enough tickets to then recoup and, and make money from that and make it financially viable. Um, I think for 22, we're in the same boat that we were in in the lead up to 21. 
Um, we've been very committed to raising those extra monies again. We did it through the South Australian government, the federal government, and also through a lot of generous donations and foundations. They've given, um, we've raised a lot of money that we've now given out to help um, people then stage their season. So that's how Fringe um, operates, is that it's an entrepreneurial sort of platform. It's a bit like thousands of small businesses, but these people are getting small grants to get their show up. And then we um, last year had a ticket um, box office of nearly 20 million, and we'll hopefully get 20 million in 22. But that's that month. That's just absolutely critical money to going into the pockets of artists and venues, particularly because all the other event, all the other events that they normally do through the year interstate have pretty much not happened. So their their earnings have been decimated in between the Adelaide um, seasons that they've been able to do. Yep. And so we're just absolutely committed to trying to make sure that um, we can make the season as financially viable as possible for as many artists as possible. And we've been able to raise a fair bit of money for that. We work with, I mean, We've worked closely with SA Health from the beginning yep. and we will continue to do so. And uh, today's, uh, the idea of the opening up is, it, it's, all it does is mean that we still have to work closely with SA Health, but we slightly, it's just a slightly different lever that's happening. We, we won't, I don't think we'll be thinking that we can start planning enormous festivals like the scale of Fringe without working with SA Health right. for a couple of years, really. Mm. Gary, any thoughts on how we can kickstart the arts industry again uh, as we come out of uh, this pandemic in terms of getting venues operating again, in terms of getting people out of the comfort zone of their homes and into venues to, uh, to, to watch live performance? Yeah, I mean, I think um, everyone got used to screens over the last couple of years and, and probably that's... Uh, her, uh, I think most people are exhausted from that. And uh, so if we look at what's happening in the States and in, um, and in Europe, people are rushing back to theatres mm -hmm. and rushing back to cinemas as well. Mm -hmm. So um, I think people are really wanting to sort of get on with um, sort of life as normal, quote unquote, as much as possible. Uh, I think some interesting things happened during um, over, over the past 18 months. Uh, for example, in South Australia, the um, Arts SA made available funds for organisations such as Australian Dance Theatre and State mm. Theatre Company, et cetera, et cetera, to, um, and it was very fast turnaround application for funds in order to employ artists. So we, um, we created a project called The World's Smaller Stage. We employed 10 independent uh, artists that were choreographers, also dancers, and and we work with Music SA on um, using music by local uh, composers and created this program um, that was specifically for uh, ex external artists uh, that was uh, was made for online con uh, consumption, but then later we performed it in a theatre. So I thought that was a really interesting model uh, that should be ongoing, where existing organisations, arts organisations, um, can apply for funding in order to um, to, to um, uplift and and uh, augment the work of independent artists and also s mm. smaller companies. Yep. So and and the same with theatres. Like I know um, in the future, you know we're sort of looking toward having a new concert hall, which would be brilliant. And but it should be a concert hall not only for the orchestra but also for electronic music artists and also have recording studios and rehearsal studios. And so it's a whole kind of total ecosystem. Mm. Um, Kate, when we talk about getting back into cinemas, yeah. we've become quite the Netflix culture mm -hmm. over the past two years. And I mean, there's been opportunities for South Australia there as well. I'm thinking of things like Gymnastics Academy, which is currently in production. But are we creating a rod for our own backs by, by putting so much focus on Netflix productions? And is that at the expense of perhaps cinemas? We, we, look, we lost the track cinema uh, not that long ago, and I'm thinking about small independent cinemas in country towns, and then and then also groups like Wallace, the South Australian owned. Cinema yes, group. look, great question, and I think I just want to add as well before we kick into that, just the um, I suppose that the screen sector really bucked against the trend of the broader arts and entertainment sector when it came to um, the impact of COVID, because in fact. Um, 
South Australia's COVID safe advantage and, you know, our 50 year history of making world class uh, film and television content enabled us as a state to really um, take advantage of, of production that needed to happen. So we had um, local producers producing more content than ever. Um, we've had um, uh, international and interstate productions looking to come to South Australia to take advantage of our sort of safe environment. So um, we've had, uh, we've been busier than ever actually as an industry. Um, and in fact, over the last few weeks, we've had a record level of production activity with um, six simultaneous productions happening at the same time. So that's a record for South Australia's history in terms of producing screen content. Um, now, when it comes to um, streaming content, look, what I would say is it's not actually all about Netflix. It's actually, um, you know, the the key thing for, for me and I think for the screen industry is our key focus is the audience. And so what we're trying to do is take um, content to the audience where the audience is going to watch it. Now, over past years, we've had a massive sort of technological disruption, both in terms of, um, <clears throat> excuse me, in terms of how content is produced. So now anyone can make a film with an iPhone really, and, and also get it out to an audience. And we're seeing, you know, hundreds and thousands of, of um, streamers and casters doing just that and running very successful businesses doing that. Um, and at the same time, we've had a massive sort of technological advancements when it comes to the distribution of content. So um, what that has meant is audiences now have more choice. Now, that is a big change. Um, it's happened very quickly. Uh, obviously, um, cinemas are somewhat impacted by that. But let's just remember that when television came in, everyone said that would be the death the death of cinema. Mm. When uh, the DVD came in, everyone said that would be the death of cinema. Cinema has survived. We know that people love going out to the cinema. We love, we know that it's actually a communal experience and that's something that you don't get from streaming. But what we have now is an environment where there is just so much more opportunity for um, storytellers and um, filmmakers to create content, to commercialize that content and to get it to their audiences, whether it's mainstream or really niche content. So I think it's an amazing opportunity for South Australian storytellers right now. <laughs> um, just to jump back to something you mentioned there, Gary, with regards to uh, plans for a concert hall and small to medium sized venues or the, the lack thereof in Adelaide continue to be a problem at peak performance times, especially during festivals. Um, we're about to lose the Bakehouse Theatre. Uh, we lost Union Hall at Adelaide University. And after decades of calls for a, a purpose-built concert hall for orchestra and other acoustic music, um, the state government's sitting on its latest study findings until next June. Uh, instead of another stadium, how could building some of these more specific venues benefit the arts industry and the arts economy. Um, Douglas, you're, you were instrumental in uh, having Adelaide uh, named as a, a UNESCO city of music, uh, and yet we don't have this concert hall. What are your thoughts on, on what we require in terms of venues? Yeah, I'd agree with Gary. I think we need a music centre and uh, that the ASO could use so that we have good acoustic uh, uh, qualities. But uh, it's also got to be a much broader centre for music as well. As you, as you quite rightly say, you know, we, uh, uh, we gained the UNESCO accreditation and that's not easy come by. Come by. You really have to prove that uh, the city has been and the community has been involved in music making of all kinds for a, a long time and doing it well. Well, we do do it well. Uh, you know, for instance, we're just about to do a series on pop music uh, with the old Roadrunner magazine. It goes back to the 80s and shows just how much Adelaide's been involved in pop music. So I think a music centre uh, that can bring together a whole bunch of music, music making activities, training, uh, both formal and informal, uh, you know, electronic music, rehearsal spaces, students, uh, community music making. And there are lots of models for that internationally very good models, and that's what we should be looking at. And uh, I think, you know, we have to think about what goes in it, then that will dictate and inform us as to what we want and how it should be built. Is there a particular international model that stands out as uh, perhaps the, the pinnacle of what we could aim for? Uh, well, there's a great, uh, there's a great uh, concert, well, it, it's, it's a 
art centre, I guess, in uh, Newcastle in the UK. It's yep. called The Sage, Gateshead. Mm -hmm. It's totally based around community music making. In what was a very depressed area uh, in the 90s, you know, with all that shipbuilding, leaving Newcastle and going to Korea. Uh, so they were refocusing on recharging the community. So it actually has been a wonderful centre for activity at all sorts of levels. Pop bands, brass bands, uh, you know, reggae, a, a symphony orchestra, plus many, uh, plus a training academy in there as well. The other one would be the proposition that was that was being put together. I think it's still alive uh, and it's a kind of triumvirate between uh, the Barbican, uh, the London Symphony Orchestra and the Guildhall School of Music, which is the, probably the best school of music in the UK now. That's going to be built in the East End, but it's got all those sorts of facilities and it's got a remit to look at community involvement as well. So there's just two. Right. So the the notion could be broader and should be broader than just a concert hall in itself. Uh, for a music centre. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Can I just add to that? Sorry. Yeah. And I can see Heather wants to as well. But look, I just think that um, in, in screen, I'll start with screen, but we're seeing that um, one of the main problems for businesses is retaining um, amazing talent in South Australia and also attracting uh, talent to South Australia to, to live and work. Now, um, actually, I think that's happening right across you know, the, the whole um, state in, in every industry that, that um, retaining and attracting talent is so important. And I think, you know, moving into an environment with, um, with the changes that we've seen in workplaces due to COVID, where people can really be based anywhere and can work from anywhere, we need to make Adelaide a really vibrant and fantastic place to live and work if we want to attract and retain that top talent here. And I think, you know, creativity, festivals, um, theatre, you know, live performance, music, um, all of that is going to be so integral to making Adelaide, you know, conti you know continue to be one of the top three liv most livable cities in the world and go even higher than that. That's what we, we really need to be doing as a state and thinking about. Yeah, and if I could, could, could I just, uh, just 20 seconds. So I think, you know, if you look at all of that and you think about, you know, our training institutions, whether it be Flinders, whether it be uh, the conservatory, whether it be uh, TAFE, uh, whether it be UniSA, all those creative arts uh, groups in those training uh, training uh, situations, I think we, we've got to look at ways that they can work closer together because this is a very uh, strong uh, you know, potential for us. And when you're talking about the sorts of things you're talking about, then, you know, again, that would be an attractor, I think. Yeah. I think we also have to think about the ecosystem of everything. It is, I mean, um, uh, music centres and central uh, state-of-the-art places are really critical in the ecosystem, but we shouldn't forget that there's many pathways and there's interventions that can happen for artists on all levels and small black box theatres are really important in the mix and we should not forget them. Um, something like the Bakehouse um, has been critical. You would get thousands of artists who would name it in their pathway of their journey um, in their career. And so I think we need to make sure that we keep in mind that there's a an ecosystem that has to be looked after and there's a lot of um, venues that are really struggling now and it's um, we need to step in and make some interventions with um, venues also look at how can we create uh, a few more black box opportunities in Adelaide um, with with Adelaide Fringe we see so often that we are yes on one side on one side we're a big audience attracting venue uh, festival but we are also a skills development platform for uh, crew for artists for so many people who use the fringe as a way to sort of it's a you know their university is is in the fringe that's what they that's what they're training up and learning there and so we need that ecosystem. We can't just rely on all of the venues being the pop-up venues that land in the parklands. That would be, you know, really a, a disaster. We need to make sure there's little black boxes around Adelaide and it's got to be that acceptance that there's as much power in the bottom up and the community led and the grassroots up as there is in the central so Heather, top down. If we're talking about uh, these black box venues, which are essentially 
you know, four mm. walls and a, a ceiling where you can mm. bring everything and anything in for, for performances. Um, you're talking about we need interventions to ensure that those exist. What sort of interventions? How do we make sure that those venues can be created or yeah. exist? Well, the sort of interventions that we've been making at Fringe in the last five years um, um, have been, we've, we've gone for the Thousand Flowers Bloom interventions. So we've, um, when I arrived, um, we had a, the beginnings of an artist fund, but it wasn't really set up in a way that there was much giving um, and dispersing of the funds. Whereas I think the first year I arrived, we gave out $30,000. We now give out six to $700,000 of, of grants across the artist landscape in the fringe every year um, for the last three years. And those are not big grants, they're small. There's a lot of small grants. And what the, the, the innovation that these artists, I mean, it's, it's um, what they'll take a five or $10,000 intervention with a grant and turn it into is unbelievable. And a lot of those artists do go on to then get picked up by high level, uh, highly funded, curated festivals and venues around. So that's what, I, that's what I'm talking about, um, uh, valuing uh, very uh, many, many small interventions that can happen that um, artists with their innovative um, approach and their entrepreneurial approach to it will turn that intervention into something much bigger and it will feed into curated programs and feed into the big um, you know, shows in the music halls, but that uh, this is that disruptive model that we've seen across you know many industries now, where you're talking about that open uh, access platform for anyone to jump on and put their entrepreneurial skills to uh, in play, yeah. whether it be uh, across you know Uber or Airbnb or whatever. That's that. It's you know this is what Adelaide's got a brilliant opportunity with grassroots led open access festivals. We've got the Fringe, we've got Sala, we've got the Umbrella Festival. The world is looking at these disruptive models that come from the ground up, not just the top down. We have the mix, you know, I mean, Airbnb didn't kill hotels. You know, we can still have the grassroots up and the top um, highly funded let down. But I think the combination of that ecosystem is what Adelaide could, um, become really unique and yep. hold on to a uniqueness because no other city that I can see has got the scale of those big open access festivals that we've got. Um, and they are, they are the things that are really unique here. Can, can I just, sorry, just yep. pop in and say for a second um, that um, <laughs> prior to the pandemic, there was another cataclysmic event which was George Brandis um, dismantling uh, the funding from the Australia Council. So already <clears throat> small companies and medium-sized companies and also independent artists across Australia were already hurting and, and were wounded by that whole thing. And we hadn't recovered from that because, I mean, a, a bit of money came back to the Austra uh, Australia Council under Mitch Feifold, uh, but, but there's still sort of like huge funding missing from the Australia Council. So, yeah, and then the pan pandemic came on, on top of that. So it is, it is really tricky time. So I think we need to get back to reinstating the, the sort of the proper funding to the Australia Council to begin with. Um, in regard to the venues, it is part of actually the SA Arts Plan um, to invest in a black box theatre. Um, <clears throat> Australian Dance Theatre is now in the Odeon uh, as in the last couple of years. So we avail that uh, when the company's on tour, but Unfortunately, there hasn't been much touring since COVID, but normally <clears throat> the company does tour quite a bit. And in those months of the year, uh, it, it's available. And with the new um, First Nations Gallery, there's also going to be a, a theatre in there, a theatre in the round. So, yeah, I think there is the, the certainly there's the commitment from the state through the arts plan. So I, we just need to I see haven't that heard unfold. much about this uh, uh, plans for a new black, black box theatre. Mm. How far advanced are they? What, what's on the uh, I, I think it's in the plan, but it pro possibly hasn't been advanced. Maybe they're sort of looking toward the space theatre to acti activate that a bit more and make that a bit more accessible. But it's certainly that came out of uh, something that came out of consultation with, with artists within South Australia. I know that we, uh, there was a dance um, review uh, a few years ago uh, that Aaron Fowler had a lot to do with and ADT had, had a bit to do with as well, facilitating community conversations. And out of that came the desire for uh, uh, like a, 
contemporary performance space, a bit like, say, um, the performance space in Sydney back mm -hmm. in the day, which is now in Carriage Works. But for many years, it was kind of a really uh, hallmark feature of the independent uh, arts sector in, in Sydney, and very, very bright, vibrant. Mm -hmm. yeah, Kate, when you mentioned before that we have record uh, numbers of productions currently in, in progress, six, um, it makes me think back to the heyday of the 1970s in South Australia. I studied film at Flinders University and um, also as a child, I remember seeing local productions such as Storm Boy and, and Sunday Too Far Away and things like that. That was such a time for South Australia and we were really on the map both nationally and internationally. Um, how do we compare now? And if we're not at that level in comparison, how do we get there? Absolutely, and it's a time that the South Australian Film Corporation is incredibly proud of. Back in the, I mean, we were established in 1972, so we're actually coming up to our 50th anniversary next year, which is gonna be an exciting time. Um, but uh, back then, the South Australian Film Corporation was actually the production company, so that was the government-owned corporation that that ran the productions and, and owned the intellectual property in them. Um, over recent times since the 1990s, actually it's been um, more industry led. So um, again, like Heather was saying, you know, we're looking to the entrepreneurialism of South Australian production companies to um, mount productions, to generate the intellectual property, to go out and release and commercialise it. So um, I think uh, what that time did in 1972 is yes, it did put us on the map, um, it also created um, from nowhere an industry in South Australia. And what we've been able to do over the past 50 years with the support of the South Australian Film Corporation, but really through the entrepreneurialism of the sector is grow um, from that very small start into a very sizable and significant industry for South Australia. Um, I would say that now we have a lot more, in fact, it'd be incomparable, the, the um, number of South Australian resident storytellers and filmmakers that are actually based here who are creating that work. Mm. In those early days, it was people coming in from Sydney to, to make their films here. So what we've been able to do is turn that right around. Now we have South Australian businesses, we have South Australian writers, South Australian directors, South Australian producers, South Australian crew, South Australian cast. Um, and those people are all working and creating really important work. I think um, when it comes to its cultural impact as well, um, like I mentioned before, with the uh, proliferation of, of ways that audiences can experience screen content now, there's just so many more ways for South Australian made productions to cut through and get out to an audience. And that's a global audience now. Whereas back in the day, you had to ship a, a literally a physical film print around. So, you know, it's a lot easier now. Um, we've had uh, projects like First Day, um, a children's series for the ABC, um, which has just won an Emmy Award. Um, so that's recognition at absolutely the highest um, sort of critical levels. Um, we've had um, a so another South Australian made production, Pomegranates, um, When Pomegranates Howl, which is a Farsi language film that was shot in Afghanistan, but it tells the story of Australia's involvement in the Afghanistan conflict. Um, so incredibly important cultural works as well that are being made and they're being made by South Australian um, businesses and creators now. So I think it's, um, you know, we've actually moved on in a positive direction from those early days as important and fabulous as they were. Just on that, uh, from what I see, it's a much more internationally collaborative process with making a lot of films these days. You watch almost any Hollywood blockbuster and in the titles, you'll see a South Australian company providing visual effects or other aspects of the services. Or you may see a company from New Zealand or from you know Victoria have also been involved as part of that. Is that a way that we, as an industry, uh, play uh, to our strengths in providing certain aspects rather than having to solely focus on wholly made productions here? Absolutely. So we have we have both strings to our bow in South Australia. We're, we're really world renowned for our, our physical screen production and the work that's generated here. But also, like you mentioned, Patrick, um, you know, our, our visual effects and post-production 
sector is absolutely world class. So companies like Rising Sun Pictures, um, like um, Technicolor are based here with their company, Mr. X, Resin, Kojo, Artisan Post Group. These are world class companies and they're sought out by um, Hollywood and international productions all the time to bring work to South Australia. So they're employing hundreds of, of people who are able to, um, you know, in, in today's age, I think there's a lot more opportunity for people to find um, work in, in the screen industry and, and really meaningful work where they're able to um, participate artistically in a process and a, and a product that's going to be seen by millions of people all around the world. So that's incredibly satisfying for the individual artists as well. And just from that sort of collaborative angle, uh, Gary, your new role as director of the Assemblage uh, Centre for Creative Arts at Flinders University uh, seems to very much uh, want to look into the future potential of cross industry and cross art form uh, work. Um, I mean, how, how do you see the centre playing into that as we go forward? And uh, how do you see that helping to evolve the arts mm. uh, for the future as we move into a more technological age? Yeah. Um, well, the, the, the initial aim of Assemblage was to set up a centre within the university uh, that, that brought, brings together the already kind of very kind of sophisticated and, and uh, formidable uh, creative arts research that was happening in in the university. Um, as we know, uh, at Flinders, there's creative writing, there's film, there's you know, kind of uh, a very long history in in drama, um, indigenous studies, et cetera, et cetera. So in, within the creative arts, so bringing those together, um, rather than everyone working separately under one structure, but also with a leaning toward uh, inter interdisciplinarity. Yep. So we live in a complex world with complex problems, and often those problems or issues can't be looked at from uh, one discipline or one perspective. So interdisciplinarity kind of permits this um, uh, kind of creates a, a mindset and, and a thinking in order to um, uh, reach across from one art form to another or across to sciences or engineering or health sciences and medicine. Um, so that's what's happening uh, at Assemblage. And um, so it's sort of really shifting <coughs> um, I guess uh, the, the, the practice of the creative arts academics uh, that exist at the moment and kind of an accenting this um, uh, tendency or toward interdisciplinarity. So we've set up a, an arts and health alliance uh, between the College of hum Humanities, Arts and Social Sciences and the Colleges of College of uh, Health Sciences and Nursing. Um, and so out of that, we're spawning a lot of projects um, where, where arts is intervening in, in, in health in a variety of ways um, through community work, through stroke rehabilitation using virtual reality and augmented reality, um, verbatim theatre and, and the processes of ageing, for example. Um, it, it's quite huge. Um, we have creative writers working with artificial intelligence over engineering. Um, I'm uh, starting a project using cobotics um, that are used in manufacturing and, and dance, so performance and, and robots. So um, it's really kind of incredibly broad reaching, but um, I guess sort of with a sort of talking about a focus on technology, uh, the reason for using technology, whenever I've worked with technology in the past, in my own practice, it hasn't sort of been about the technology itself. It's about what can it do for us, you know? And I think technology, you know, is interesting because it provi provides a new canvas. It's a new way of saying something, a new way of seeing something. And, and of course, you know, at, at, the, at the very sort of fundamental level of making, of art making practice, um, it's it's um, it's about sort of agency in the world and exploring the world and and reframing the world in ways that we haven't seen it before and and technology certainly permits that. I mean, we are oriented toward novelty. Yeah. You know, we want to see things in in new ways. And in fact, when we see things in new ways, um, it actually releases dopamine uh, in the body and also it brings it gathers a community around uh, the arts as well. Um, yeah. Well, one of the great things about the arts is that uh, it can take technology or other implements and often use them for purposes other than that which they were originally designed or intended for. Mm. Uh, and from that, 
uh, new discoveries can be made. Mm. Uh, mm. That technology can then be applied to other areas that it was never originally even mm. conceived for. Is that yeah. the sort of thing that you foresee assemblage doing with other sciences and industries within the South Australian economy? Yeah, I think those kind of interventions into other fields is sort of uh, it sort of has a disruptive nature. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, I, I don't think, uh, for example, uh, the, the the programmers uh, in, in the engineering department ever thought they'd be working with dance, for example. And uh, I, I recently uh, there was a collaboration with Stellark, mm -hmm. uh, the renowned uh, Australian robotics artist and uh, multimedia artist, and and so I think there was sort of a bit of circumspection around creating that project. Project from the point of view of the programmers and the engineer, engineers, but in the end, they loved making that project because it sort of brought them a new audience. And I think that's what's an inter interesting thing about the arts is that you know we can you know we, we can read about um, through the news and we can hear data on what's happening in the world, but artists take that data and, and the, those stories and those facts and turn them into kind of um, uh, these kind of emblems that have aff affect and, and emotion kind of embedded in them and, and are quite transformative. So, I mean, one of the most powerful things I've ever seen in terms of telling the story of uh, the Australian refugee story is Stateless, um, which was just such a brilliant, brilliant and, and incredibly moving um, uh, depiction of the Australian relationship with, with the sort of refugees. Um, I made a work many, many years ago after September 11th called The Age of Unbeauty, which was reflecting also on um, on the status of refugees in the world. And because I wanted to take what we read in the news on a daily basis and kind of dismiss and turn it into something that had, a, had a, an emotional impact. Um, so I think that's, that's kind of part of um, the function of the arts within, in society is to, is to create that, that sort of emotional impact and bring communities together to understand the world in a different way beyond sort of data and, and facts. Yeah. And those um, uh, educational paths at Flinders University can often lead into other uh, areas and, and diversify as well. Douglas, you yourself were a, a drama student and graduate, I believe, at, at Flinders University back in the day. I did dabble, yeah. <laughs> Actually, I was a history graduate, but yes, I, yeah, look, I, I think uh, Flinders has always been, uh, you know, it, it was the sort of uh, uh, you know, left wing, uh, a fearless university back in those days, particularly during the Vietnam War, et cetera. And so it was a hotbed of uh, discussion and uh, you know, bubbling through. And from a creative point of view, it had the first had the first drama department in in the country. People like Wild Cherry and others, uh, you know, great film director in Bogdan Trucken, who was up there, uh, a really interesting mix of people. And uh, I, I think uh, it's always been at the forefront uh, of uh, creative arts and industries. And so it's great to have Gary there. But, you know, the other thing about it is it's usually been pretty strongly connected with the community as well, which I think, you know, Gary, Gary and others are, are trying to do, which is, which is really exciting. And this is a question for everyone. And just talking about Flinders, I remember speaking to Noni Hazelhurst and she was saying what a progressive university it was for women. Um, do you feel that in the arts sector now that we, we that women are, are getting enough funding, getting enough profile? Um, yeah. Oh, look, I'd love to step in there and just say, you know, diversity of um, perspective in all its forms is really critical, I think, um, for, it's actually critical for audiences. They want, they want that. They want to see work that is um, diverse in its perspective, that it's, that is authentic, that is authentically told. And so what we're seeing is a, um, because of that demand from audiences, we're seeing a greater imperative for um, broadcasters and streamers and others and, in, and government agencies as well to support work that is um, driven and created by women, by female identifying people, um, by First Nations people, um, by deaf and disabled people, um, by people from all the underrepresented backgrounds, uh, because it's actually, um, that's what audiences want to see. And audiences want to see our diverse and multicultural society 
reflected back to them on their screens. So that's that's one perspective. I think that's um, the the. Mac, um, in the interventions that I referred to earlier about the grants that we've been able to give out through the generosity of donors and, and so on, that we've been able to raise that money so we can give it out. We have um, really prioritised giving those grants to um, uh, artists from diverse backgrounds, um, artists who identify as female. Like we have um, uh, at over half, pretty much around about half of our program is artists who identify as female. So the fringe in um, in that open access um, nature that we have does see, we do see a lot of female artists and female producers and female arts workers across the fringe platform. Um, but we have made um, a real commitment to, for example, um, increasing First Nations artists um, who participate in fringe. So we've found that um, dispersing grants out to help um, get people onto the platform and, on, and putting shows on, those, uh, our grants have been focused on increasing diversity and identifying areas where we feel um, are not represented and how can we increase that diversity there. And, and that has included um, interdisciplinary um, immersive work as well. So we've done the big projects like um, Yabara where we've brought together First Nations um, storytelling with some of the most cutting edge digital immersive technology and we'll continue um, to do that again as well. It's interesting, um, you know, just talking about interdisciplinarity before with assemblage, uh, you know, uh, in the world, there's no such thing as disciplines, really. There's just like, you know, the sort of phenomena, phenomena of people um, sort of acting. Uh, but I, I think interdisciplinarity and the dissolution of in artificial barriers between genres is also um, concurrent with intersectionality in um, in identities, and so the, the sort of dissolving of absolutes within in in identity and and fluidity in how we see ourselves in the world, and um, and the emergence of of underrepresented groups. Um, so I think kind of all of those kinds of things tie in together and are sep separate mm. from each other. Other, this sort of calling into question the sort of those sort of big um, historically held tropes such as disciplines um, sort of are, are kind of undergoing kind of massive change and, and they're think, all reflecting each other. And I think also there is um, there is power in breaking down those disciplines in terms of innovation that can really come out of unexpected collaborations and even if if the even if those disciplines may have been you know, manufactured and not really just a natural uh, order, but they do, they have existed. And so when you get um, unexpected collaborations, it's when there's a shared language, a new shared language mm. that is unexpected, that suddenly um, innovation can emerge that really you couldn't have scripted. I mean, we, we've, we're just closing our program at the moment and we're talking to a, a guy who was a um, nautical engineer and he experimented a little bit with a program that we did years ago and ended up creating virtual reality swings that take you out into outer space and take you flying overseas and, mm -hmm. and so on. And now that is going to be um, a show that's going to be in the fringe. So there'll be these virtual reality swing experiences that you can um, you know, strap yourself into the swing and, and go out on a hang glider or a helicopter or whatever. And that is something that came from... Uh, someone who was a nautical engineer started talking to some artists, started talking to some coders. He is no longer a nautical engineer. He's specialising in uh, mm. delivering virtual reality swing um, arts experiences mm -hmm. in festivals. So, you know, unexpected collaborations mm. yeah. can um, deliver the most amazing innovations. Mm. Could I make just a point about yeah. inclusion, diversity? I, I think, uh, you know, that's a really important point. Uh, about what we do and how we make it accessible to the broader community. Uh, and, and particularly, I think large arts organisations, the most successful ones worldwide that are operating in multicultural communities, have to think much more about inclusivity and who are the gatekeepers and deciding you know, how these things are run and operated uh, with that in mind. But our connections with Asia, are, I think, are really important. Um, if you consider, I think, in the 2016 census, 
over 16% of the population identified having some Asian ancestry or another. Second spoken language after English is Mandarin. Third Arabic, then Cantonese. So, you know, the, there is a shift going on in our community mm. and we are in the Asia Pacific mm. you know, uh, region. So, and we do have a lot of international students often who we don't welcome as well as we might, you know. Mm. It's a huge investment for us. And so I think the arts and culture in, in, that, uh, in that frame, mm. uh, you know, we have a big responsibility and a big opportunity. Traditionally, a <clears> lot <throat> of those, um, I guess minority groups or ethnic uh, uh, communities haven't made up a large part of the theatre going and performance going uh, no. population here. I mean, obviously, with uh, programs like Oz Asia, it's looking to bring them into the fold more. But but how do we do that on a, a bigger scale? How do we make uh, performance more inviting and more, um, uh, I, I guess, appealing? to diverse audiences? Well, I think we've got to be much more open-minded and, uh, uh, and, and the sorts of people that we see who are coming in uh, to create work, uh, you know, would be from different backgrounds. And certainly in terms of the parameters uh, that uh, our cultural institutions have as far as responsibility for good civic society, mm -hmm. some of the thinking has to change. Uh, and. Uh, you know, the decision makers uh, need, to, uh, we need to involve some of the people from those groups. It's interesting just watching what Annette Chun War has done uh, in with Oz Asia this year and bringing uh, a bunch of people who have been working, you know, Asian Australians have been working in film and uh, cooking and writing and, and theatre uh, that often, you know, don't get a look in. Suddenly there they are and they're wonderful and they've got great perspectives to offer and they enrich uh, our, our community. And I think that's the key is if we if we um, open up the opportunity to people from those underrepresented groups to tell their stories, to tell it in language, mm -hmm. to um, reflect their culture, um, then those those exact communities will go and see the work <laughs> because they, they want to see, see their work. stories exactly they want to see their stories yep. mm. and stories they connect with so we have to allow them to yeah, exactly mm. to the decision making it has to come right back and so we um i think the change can only come when it's uh, we, we shake up the way the decisions are made who's making the decisions um oh. we're it's also been in the news recently about uh, the upcoming second phase of the Riverbank redevelopment. And uh, I guess one of the things that seems to have worked very well interstate and overseas is where the arts and cultural precinct is very much mixed in with nightlife, with food and entertainment. Mm -hmm. You know, that sort of thing seems to bring people into not just the precinct, but also break down those barriers and, and give them a bit of an introduction into the associated theatres and venues. Yeah. Uh, is look, that something that, that you really are hoping to see? Yeah, I think we really place? aspire to it. I mean, I think Riverbank's gone through uh, some difficult iterations, uh, but we're optimistic about it. I do think that New Plaza area uh, will uh, become a gateway for that multi-leisure precinct, if you like. You've got sports, you've got entertainment, you've got conventions, your arts, culture, all of that. And now, of course, you'll have Flinders University there as well in that new tower building. Um, but if, if you look at that, uh, you know, uh, amalgam of various offerings and and the offering to the public and the attraction, I think it's got a lot going for it. And I think arts and culture, both you know, high arts through to, you know, the community and more populist and entertainment has a very important role in that. The same way, I think we were trying to look at, you know, rebuilding Her Majesty's Theatre for Chinatown and, and the Market Precinct, that hopefully it would be an anchor proposition for arts and culture and entertainment in that precinct, which I think has got a lot going for it too. Got different flavour, but the principle is the same. So we have world-class courses at Flinders University, as we've discussed, but how do we make the arts an attractive career to someone? Because I think of, say, Ian Darling, who did a show with Greg Fleet earlier this year, and his big regret, regret was that he studied law and didn't do drama. 
Mm. Um, how do we how do we become fearless so that someone who wants to work in the arts can say to mum and dad or whoever, I'm not going to be a doctor, I'm not going to be a lawyer. How do we make it a, a real career for people? We, we've recently been interviewing a lot of artists that have put on seasons in Fringe and just trying to hear from them what is the experience they had and um, understanding um, what, um, what would they say to themselves if, if they were a few years younger. Um, a lot of them have spoken about the business of arts and how important it is and how actually it's over, it's often overlooked. It's not um, uh, focused on and so that people can understand the business side of arts to make it financially viable to survive in the arts and not just look always towards big funding pots, but actually how to generate funds across multiple um, streams, whether it's through box office, through other all sorts of ways. And so a lot of the artists that we've interviewed that have um, had great um, years at the Fringe talked about wanting to have more training in the business of arts and understanding the entrepreneurial opportunities in the arts. And almost all of them said, um, if, if there was one line they all said, they said, I wish I'd done it earlier. I wish I'd just jumped in and uh, taken a risk and taken on this chance of the entrepreneurial opportunity that um, often um, the certain opportunities that are, well, the open access nature of fringe does offer it, but there's a lot of other open access opportunities that happen. and. Almost all of these artists said, I just wish I'd done it earlier because once I learned how to unlock the business side and make the, make the most of the entrepreneurial side of these uh, platforms, they realised, oh, I can take that outside of the fringe month and I can do that in venues all year and I can tour the regions and I can, and, and so on. So I think there's, there's, um, the business of arts needs to be um, really looked at and what is the mechanism for how you can make funds that are not just about unlocking big funding from government pots because if you can understand the, um, the, 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 the ecosystem of a number of different income streams making sense to survive as an artist, then you're really um, on the way to being able to uh, make some sort of go at being an artist and having a financial, um, you know, making it financially viable. I, I think, oh, sorry, sorry. No, I, you... I was just going to say, I think also recognising the value of the creative industries mm. to South Australia. So um, in, I think it was in 2018, 19, um, the creative industries contributed over $1.4 billion worth of direct GVA to the state. So it's a it's a very significant industry. It employs over 15,000 full-time employees. And I think that what what as through the sort of um, recognition that Heather was talking about, that um, what's available to, pe to people and young people um, who want to apply an entrepreneurial approach to creating um, and commercialising their creations, um, I think uh, is opening up careers and, and opportunities in the creative industries to everybody. You, you don't have to any, any longer um, be supported by, you know, wealth in your, in your personal life. You know, any, this is available and open to anyone, anyone that has an idea that wants to chase after it. And I think that's the sort of mentality we're, we're definitely seeing from the generations coming behind us. I think it's really complicated because, um, you know, at, at the kind of federal level, if we have leaders that sort of aren't, sort of, um, supporting how important the arts are by say doubling fees to um, sort of to do a BA in, in the arts. I think that that's really tricky. Um, so if you don't have that sort of leadership saying this is important and we value this, uh, when, you know, when Australian Dance Theatre, when we tour to Europe, you know, we'll be in a town of 150,000 people on a cold Tuesday night in the middle of winter to a completely sold out uh, house. And it's really interesting because uh, we, you sort of realise how embedded the arts is in the broader culture and in the consciousness of um, uh, across the complete society. So I guess that needs to come sort of from the ground up here through through education kind of at the school level and the, the intervention of arts in, in all other disciplines and the relationship between the arts and kind of uh, through, through other disciplines and just sort of life in general. Um, but 
Yeah, I, I, I think that's really important that we uh, also recognise that there's been a, a democratisation of the art somewhat through the internet and through software and that, that's now available and hardware that's really available that's really cheap, um, you know, particularly in um, sort of video production production and music production. I mean, anyone in their bedroom can can write music, create a film, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, I mean, I noticed even, even within dance, a lot of young dancers want to be choreographers. But when I first started choreographing, it, there was a sense that um, artists were kind of like that, that were working um, at that creative level of, of choreographing and directing um, that they were very few and far between but now there's sort of a more egalitarian view of, of who can be an artist and who can be a director who can be a choreographer who can be a composer that we all have that within us I think just the point about the creative industries is so important that we do um, take a, a serious look and then measure the impact that the creative industries is having um, in in terms of job creation, in terms of impact, in terms of social impact. I'd love to see more um, measures that go beyond economic impact. I'd love to see more um, uh, taken seriously mm. the social impact that um, the creative industries has and it would be a, a wonderful um, body of work to see because I think it's often rather dismissed when we try to put that forward, um, when we try to tell that side of the story to the government. Um, it's, it's an important piece of the pie that is yet to be worked out. How do we measure and how do we tell that story um, in, in a really strong way? That seems like a wonderful note to end today's discussion on and we'd like to thank the panel for joining us and thank you to Patrick for co-hosting with me. Now, to keep the conversation going, use the hashtag, hashtag Fearless Conversations on Twitter and it's not over because if you want to watch this forum again, you can do so and you can also look at past Fearless Conversations on adelaidenow.com.au uh, forward slash fearless conversations. So thank you very much again to our panel for joining us and thank you to our virtual audience as well. Thank you. Mm -hmm.